everybody that's been following kind of my conversation about the NBA all year, and you and I started right at the beginning of the season, November 1, uh, I was kind of making light of them all year. Like, oh, the magic, like the magic. Like, wait, when's the drop-off coming? Lo and behold, it never came, man. It never came. They stayed steady all year long. And here we are, the last week of the season, they got a shot at the two seed. If they went out, they're the two seed in the Eastern Conference. Um, I can't be more impressed with the way they play and the way that their young talent has developed over the course of the season. What is up, everybody, and welcome to a special edition of the All NBA Show, part of the All City Podcast Network. We're looking at end of season awards, and today we're looking at Coach of the Year. I'm Adam Mares. I'm joined by Tim Legler. Legs, a lot of young coaches this year uh, at the top of the Coach of the Year uh, nominations. There are a lot of young coaches, and I think for me, when I look at this award, very difficult. First of all, this is a very difficult one to quantify. I think there's two ways to look at it. I think one is what did you deal with in terms of adversity with injuries, things like that, right? Who was missing for you and you still were able to you know, keep keep things grinding along and, and keep it on the right track. And then I think the other way, the other component of it is just look at your pieces. What are your assets, even at full strength? What are you working with? And then relative to the record that you delivered, how do you get them to play together? Um, and then like the, the last component for me is just the eyeball test of looking at what I think goes into well-coached teams, which is yeah. defensive preparation going into a game, adjustments within the game, um, the way you manage your rotation, the stuff that you come up with in, in terms of critical possessions, what wrinkles can you put in, what can you run, connection to players, communication ability, like all those are all things I'm watching when I look at guys coach. So you add up all of that and you get the short list of guys who I think have a right to that award this year. Well, let's get into the list because there's a lot of candidates. The top, uh, we're using DraftKings Sportsbook, of course. Uh, looking at the odds here, at the top is Mark Dagnott, minus 220. That's a pretty heavy favorite. If you're a negative there on those odds, that means you're a pretty good favorite. Mark Dagnott and the Oklahoma City Thunder, they've had a phenomenal year. They've surprised a lot of people with their win-loss total. And I think he has been a very um, hands-on, game-by-game coach. He makes a lot of adjustments. He has ga smart game plans. What? How would you define him, and, and what's the case for him as coach of the year? Yeah, man. Look, I've, I've grown to really admire him over the course of the season. Um, first of all, you're talking about a team that doesn't have weaknesses on either end of the floor. They, they play both ways. I think that goes into coaching. They can beat you defensively. They can beat you with great offense. They have great, great connectivity offensively. And part of that is personnel and, and guys knowing their limitations. But you have to make guys understand their limitations and accept what it is that you want from them offensively and get them to buy in for the greater good. That's not an easy conversation to have with young players that are all trying to sort of feel their way and and put their stamp on the league. That's It's a hard thing to accomplish, uh, the combination of individualism and then team concept. They do that. Every night you watch them play, they do it. And I just don't necessarily think going into the year, Adam, I would have looked at their roster and like blown away. Like, oh, yeah, Oklahoma City, absolutely. This is a 55-win team. Nobody was going to say that about Oklahoma City going into the year. And yet here they are, uh, four games to play. They win two. They're at 55. So they might even surpass that. So any way you slice it, it, they, they they check every box. Now, they've had great health. That goes into it. They've been intact pretty much the entire year. That's a big part of it, and that's a nice luxury to have for a coach. He hasn't had to de deal with too many injuries with that core. But regardless, it's a very well-coached team. They connect to him, and I admire the way that they play every night. I think the culture part is huge. So Dagnot, I look at, he seems to make very good game plans and adjustments. They're one of the teams. We've talked about it this year on the show, but – they seem to make more adjustments game by game and and make you know adjust their game plan game by game more than most teams. There are some teams that don't at all. They just want to run their stuff and we're going to get good at what we do. They adjust a lot. But they also have young players that have bought into roles. And I think about this. There are four players you could look at between Chet Holmgren, Jalen Williams, Shea Gildas Alexander, and Josh Giddy. Four guys who all realistically should be hoping for and expecting big money. 
and yet, oftentimes when you get two guys that are doing that, okay, you can survive two because there's enough big money for two guys. There's not for four. And the fact that you've been able to go several years now with this core and have everybody buy into their role, but also have everybody excel in their role, they're not going to be able to pay all of them. They're going to have to make some decisions. But the fact that that hasn't become an anchor on this team to me, I don't. I think that's an underrated aspect of coaching, to be able to get guys to say, hey, play this role, play that role. Everybody sacrifice for each other, and you're all going to succeed. And I think that's how it'll play out, too. I think all those guys will end up getting paid. He did a good job of fostering that. Yeah, completely agree, man. Big, big fan. And I didn't know much about him when he got this gig. I'll be the first to admit it. And I kind of had to watch them and see. He's very comfortable in his own skin on that sidelines, man. There's no there's <laughs> yeah. no trepidation in his – he believes in himself. And the way he carries himself with his demeanor I think is fantastic. Yeah, he's basically in sweatpants, man. Of course, he's he's, he's the most casual dress coach in the history of sports. Um, Chris Finch is another guy that I think has done a great job both with X's and O's but also with culture building. That Minnesota Timberwolves team, even this iteration of it, hasn't always had the best culture. They seem to have a phenomenal one. Uh, I think he he's the number two guy on this list plus 300. I think he has a very strong case as well. Yeah, I think he does too. I think um, – I don't know if – you know. People are, are they going to give him enough credit for the improvements defensively? Like, and that's going to play into, I think, this coach of the year award. I think, is it going to be a, you know, we got Rudy Gobert out there now and for a full season, and this is what right. it's going to look like when you throw Gobert into the mix, right? So, I, that's going to play into this, but there's no doubt about it. This has, been, this has been the most consistently good defensive team in the league we've had all year in a league that I don't think has a lot of that. Minnesota is a team that does that. I think he's navigated the situation very well with uh, Carl Anthony Towns going out. I think at times that probably isn't an easy situation either with the Towns Edwards dynamic offensively. I think that probably hasn't been the easiest thing for, for Finch to navigate. I think he's done a pretty good job of it for the most part. Um, yeah. And look, they were good last year and you know, they, they were, they were a team that, you know, now is gone from good to, Hey, you, you know, potentially the number one seed in the Western conference or certainly a team that, a lot of people think can make a legitimate run and maybe be the last team standing against Denver when it's all said and done. Um, definitely going to get some votes, so there's no question. He deserves to be in here. The next guy is my dark horse that I love here is Jamal Mosley plus f uh, 550. Now, here's the funny thing, Legs. So much of this is narrative and momentum. And all year, the Timberwolves and the Thunder with young superstars, they've been a top one or two seed, and now they're both, you know, one of those teams is going to be a three seed. Orlando all year has been a six or seven seed. And at the end of the year, they've raced up the leaderboard and now they're going to be a three seed. And I just feel like if that was different, they're basically arriving in the same spot. But if that was different and the, and the magic were the three seed all year, mostly might have a little more momentum. So I always find that psychological thing, uh, you know, interesting, but mostly has been phenomenal. Nobody had Orlando, that Orlando magic as a three seed in the Eastern conference. Yet here they are. They play extremely hard. They're great def uh, defensive team. And like we talked about with the Thunder, they have a lot of young players, but not co no conflict. And I think those things are those are all impressive coach of the year traits. All great points by you. I also add to it. I just I don't think there's any way you could look at their roster now. Now look, Bancaro is the real deal, and we needed yeah. to see more of him this year to know that. I don't think anybody would have looked at this roster at the beginning of the season and said, by the way, you keep saying, you know, referencing that they could be the three seed. Guess what? They can't control their own destiny here. They play the Bucks oh, twice the last week of the season. They play Milwaukee twice. And they've got a game against Houston. Like, they, they could be the two seed in the East when it's all said and done. I mean, if if, if he pulls that off, mm -hmm. I, I just feel like they should shut the award down and just give it to him. If they get the two seed with this roster – and now look – I'm not trying to denigrate these players, but I'm just saying when you looked at their ceiling offensively, each of these guys individually, they, they didn't. It, there's no way you could have convinced me this team is going to push 50 wins, and yet here they are. So I think Jamal Mosley has a great case for it, for it. It might be a sneaky bet here, plus 550 to lay a bet down because, like you mentioned, if they end up a two seed, you could get a bunch of people last minute that change their vote. Uh, and swing over towards him. Uh, the last three, I'll just put lump them together. Joe Mazzula plus 4,000. Tom Thibodeau and Rick Carlisle both plus 20,000. These are more just token. You know, they're also in the conversation, but not really. Is there a case for either of these guys in your mind? I think the best, strongest case for any of those would probably be Carlisle. Um, I, I think they've created, and he has changed the way he thinks in, uh, in terms of coaching too, which he's adapted to his personnel and he's allowed them to play according to 
what they have and the pieces they have and what's their best style. And so as a result, there's a lot of nights, man, this is just going to be a flat out track meet. And can you keep up with them? And he's, he's embraced it. And that's hard sometimes for old school coaches to kind of embrace that style of play. And he's done it. I hear they are sitting here 11 games over 500. They, by the way, still have, an, have a shot to get higher than six. They're six right now. They could get as high as three, really, but certainly four or five are within reach for the Indiana Pacers. And again, didn't see that coming at the start of the year. Now, Halliburton's emergence has a lot to do with that, but I would put Carlisle, I think, ahead of the other two guys. Look, Mazzola already had a great team, and they added Porzingis and Holiday. He's not going to get a ton of credit for that. And I think he's done a much better job than last year. He's just not going to get enough credit when you add that kind of talent. And you already had Tatum and Brown. It's just not going to fall his way. Uh, and who was the other one? Oh, Tom Thibodeau. Yeah, t- I think Tibbs has a good argument for it with some of the injuries they've dealt with. Um, they continue to play that way. So, I, But I think most people identify that team with more Brunson than him. So that'll probably hurt him. That's why I think Carlisle has the best shot of those three guys. All right, well, let's get to some snubs here. And I'm going to start with one that always blows my mind. Not that I think he should win, but he's never brought up in the conversation, and that's Michael Malone with Denver. Jokic, <laughs> we know, gets the lion's share of the credit for any of Denver's success. Denver has a chance this year, and I think they're probably going to do it, to set a franchise record for rate for wins in the regular season. Malone's never mentioned in this. Why do you think that is, and do you think he deserves more consideration? Absolutely. There is no question. I love Mike Malone. Um, I love how he – how fiery he is during games, how intense he is. And it's, it's rare to see that at the NBA level. That's more like a college mentality in a lot of ways. And, and he's able to get away with it because of the character of his players and the way that they respect him allows him to, to get right to the point with what needs to happen and change in the course of a game or in an off day. He says things honestly about his team after games at his post-game pressers that most guys would be terrified to say. He's not worried about ruffling feathers. Um, why he doesn't get more credit, it's the, it's Nikola Jokic, plain and simple. A lot of people look at Jokic and they think, well, geez, man, this guy is is with, with CPU like that between his ears. I mean, he's <laughs> running the show. It's all about what Jokic yeah. does, right? He's just like this robot out there getting it done. And I think it's unfair to Mike Malone. But if you ask me the reason why, I think that's the reason. Yeah, I think you're right about it. And very coachable player as well. So I know a lot of coaching is how do you connect with your star player? Jokic seems to be a guy, what a rare star that says, "Hey, it's easy, man. Don't worry about me. I'll, I'll adjust to you." What um is there anybody else that you think deserves a mention here that doesn't isn't isn't on this list? Probably Ime Udoka should get some credit uh, again. Yeah. That that's that's a roster that that you know didn't look like they were going to be anywhere near five hundred, and they got hot late to get close to it. They, I mean, they were really good earlier. Then they, then they went into like a long yeah. stretch where they weren't very good, and then they got red hot. They won eleven straight games, and they got within like breathing distance of the Warriors looked like they were going to run them down actually at one point before Golden State put that to bed but still look they're 38 and 40 they've got a chance you know to get right around 500 for the year with a very young core and and look at a completely different way we view that team and that organization going forward than how their season ended a year ago. He's in a good position. If we look ahead to next year, he's in a good position to, because the Rockets are going to finish in the uh, outside of the play in, they're a team that could make a big move. I mean, obviously we have to have an off season, see what happens. But as I look forward to the next year, I look at that one and go, he might be a guy that's a top three candidate next year by default, because everybody knows he's a great coach every year. His team plays defense and they might have a huge win loss uh, gain between this year and next year. All right. So of the candidates, who would be your pick? I would go with Jamal Mosley, full disclosure. I usually get most improved player, coach of the year, defensive player of the year wrong. I've got different <laughs> I've got different ways I view them than a lot of these people that vote. And, and actually, if you saw a list of all the people that got the vote, you'd be shocked yeah. at some of the people that get the cast to vote when you know they're not watching games every night yeah. the way we are. Um, I'd go with Jamal Mosley, man. And, and, and I, everybody – that's been following kind of my conversation about the NBA all year. And you and I started right at the beginning of the season, November one, uh, I was kind of making light of them all year. Like, Oh, the magic, like the magic, like wait, when's the drop off coming? Lo and behold, it never came, man. It never came. They stayed steady all year long. And here we are the last week of the season. They got a shot at the two seed. If they went out there, the two seed in the Eastern conference, um, I can't be more impressed with the way they play 
and the way that their young talent has developed over the course of this season to supplement what I didn't think they had. I don't, cause I don't think they have a true point guard on the roster. It's very hard to win in the NBA with that. And yet they find a way to do it with two really talented young forwards and Ben Carroll and Wagner. So relative to what their roster looked like going into the season and where I thought they would finish, this is by far the team that surpassed my expectations. And then we've said this on the show before, but you got to watch Mosley in person. That guy's my favorite coach to watch the coach because he burns 5,000 calories a game. He's screaming. He's jumping. He's crouching. He's very passionate as he coaches. And he rides the highs when his team's playing well and guys are coming out. He's running over to him and stuff. He's he's almost like a college coach with the energy he brings. So you said Mosley. I love it. I'm taking Mosley too. I think Dagnot's going to win it. But I actually think Mosley's year has been way under the radar, and I'm glad – both you and I are giving him a little bit of shine. Let us know in the comments. What do you think? Who is your nominee? Is there somebody that you think was snubbed and should be on the list? Let us know what you think, guys. Thanks for watching. We'll see you on the other side.